All right, so guys, do we have any questions then over this material? So basically, we go through the weathering process, and we get these different sizes based on the weathering process. And after it's been weathered, what happens next? Erosion and transportation. So again, erosion is just the process of being moved away <coughs> from the parent rock. And transport is the action of being moved. So I mean, these two really are very similar. They're basically one and the same. When you're being eroded and being transported, it's all kind of happening simultaneous. And we think about ways that we can erode or move this stuff away. There are four agents that typically do this. We have wind. All right. uh, for those of you guys who live out in the country, during the summer when we get those really uh, severe thunderstorms come in, you might be out in the fields and that wind picks up, what happens? What do you start feeling that it starts to hit your skin? Right. You feel all that dirt, like literally just pounding in the face. One of the craziest uh, days I ever had in Arizona, we had these things that they call monsoons. And basically with the monsoons, you get these winds that can get upwards of 80 miles an hour. And I'm trying to bike my way home from work. And I've just turned the corner, and I've got like less than a block to go. <laughs> and I'm going right into the wind. And no matter how hard I pedal, <clears throat> I'm going nowhere. And I'm getting blasted with sand the whole time. And okay, so that's an example of how wind can pick up all that dirt and just move it. When we think about places like the Sahara, you get these migrating uh, sand dunes, and they're basically pushed by the wind. Another one, obviously, is moving water. We have most of our transport, especially in our region, is from moving water, and then you have gravity. And there's also glaciers. And glaciers are basically nature's big bulldozer. They plow through the crust. Why are you looking around the classroom like that? Yeah. And then after that, we get the positive. That's what it is. <laughs> so we look at being the positive. Well, why don't you guys stop and think about that? If we think about a good definition for deposition, it's the laying down of plastics. How does that work? <coughs> yeah, but why? Well, one of the things that can happen, with, especially for, especially if you like look up here at this image, and we have water, and we have moving water, water has this ability to transport a lot of sediments. But it can only do that if it has a high enough velocity to keep those sediments in suspension. So I want you guys to think about a hose for a minute. And then think about just holding the hose and turning the water on. What happens to the water? How far? Not far. Go down and drop right down, right? Depending on the pressure. Okay, depending on the amount of water pressure you have. Now put your thumb over that into the hose. <coughs> what happens to the water? Why does it go farther? Not, it's a little bit about the pressure, but not so much about the pressure. It's this bigger idea. There you go. It's called fluid dynamics. And with that, Basically, with fluid dynamics, you have to have an equal in and an equal out. So, if you think about it like this, 
if I have this much water coming into a funnel, and then I only have that much space that I can come out, equal in and equal out. So the same amount of material that I'm coming in in a second has to be the same amount going out in the same time. So the only way to get that to happen is that this actually has to flow faster to get that more, much more water out. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's reverse that. <clears throat> if I'm constricted, I'm flowing at a much faster rate. So what happens when I hit an open area? Slows down drastically. And because I've slowed down, now I've lost that ability to keep those sediments in suspension. And so what happens is they start to fall out. Well, which ones do you think are going to fall out first? You know, the more dense materials, right? So the bigger materials. And so what happens with this is we get these layered depositions. We're going to see that here in this video. Where you guys can see that the pebbles and the cobbles are deposited almost immediately while the very light silt and clay goes all the way out to the outer edge. And so we get this layering of materials as we move away. And so this, when we think about deltas and the way that they're created, you're going to find a lot of silt and clay far out from the delta, and you're going to find a lot more pebbles and cobbles towards the mouth of the delta. <coughs> we can also see that demonstrated when we look at things that we call alluvial fans. So this is basically what we call an alluvial fan. And all that really means is it's obviously it's got that nice little fan shape, you know, like a little hand fan. And the alluvials are basically like classic sediments, which is a lot of loose sediments. But you can see how it comes down from this mountain valley, which is a very restricted space. So the water's flowing very fast. And then Alyssa, as soon as we hit up in the open valley, what happens at velocity? We go from a restricted space into an open space, so what happens to the velocity of that water? It slows down, and therefore, the stuff starts to fall out of suspension. So we can see that in model here. And when you look at the particles, you can see even from <coughs> far away. Compare the size of the particles up here versus down here by the lake. How do their particle sizes compare? And we get bigger ones up towards the mouth, and we get finer particles farther out. So we have density and gravity, basically the way that we go. So guys, when does deposition stop? When do we stop depositing material? What do you guys think? When will we stop doing that? <coughs> well, basically when there's nothing to transport anymore. When we lose our transport, that's when we stop depositing. Okay, so we'll keep depositing as long as that material is in the transport material. 